Welcome. Welcome to Financial Accounting. This is um, a new book for me, Sungage Financial Accounting. The author is Warren, and we are starting fresh with Chapter 1. So we're going to begin discussing what is accounting and how does it relate to businesses? So this um, slide here shows you the various objectives we're going to cover in this first chapter. We're going to understand business and how accounting plays out in businesses. And we're going to talk about what we call GAAP, the generally accepted accounting principles. And with that gap, those accepted accounting principles, how we have various assumptions and principles that play out with gap. One of the biggest things, and I tell students, this is one of the, probably the most important aspects of accounting is what we call the accounting equation. The accounting equation is assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. And we'll talk about that. And then we'll begin talking about various business transactions and how we go about analyzing them and communicating them in the form of the accounting equation. Then we'll talk about proprietorships, which is a real simple form of business. Um, and the financial statements associated with a small business. And then we'll finish up by talking about some ratios. So guys, what is a business? Well, a business is an entity in which um, the business is in, it, it exists for a certain purpose. And so, the business has basic resources that have either materials and labor. They get assembled and processed to provide goods or services. So there's inputs and there are outputs. So you can look at a CPA practice. I own a CPA firm. So we have various inputs, software, labor um, employees, um, we have various uh, books, resources, rent, you know, just um, items that we need in order to then provide that service. And in our case, the services would be a tax return. If you think of our school, the school has various inputs that provide education for the end user, the customers. Then there are other kinds of businesses such as Target, Best Buy. Um, uh, boy, you could, the, the local hardware store down the street, or how about Jiffy Lube where you get your oil changed? I mean, there's companies, which are entities, organizations, which there are basic resources and it depends on the type of company, what kind of resources um, they have based on what they're providing are assembled and processed to provide either a good goods or services or both to customers. Now profit is the difference between the amounts received from customers for goods or services, and then the amounts that are paid for those inputs used to provide the goods and services. So just because you may pay X amount of dollars for an oil change or X amount of dollars for tuition or whatever that product is or service is, there's a lot of costs that go in to the company in order to provide that product. So the difference, the net, 
is what is profit. Now, it's probably not real smart for me to use the school as an example because our school, Anoka Ramsey, is a nonprofit institution. But most businesses are created for profit, which the goal is to have greater resources or a, a net benefit from the difference between the revenues and the expenses, what the inputs are minus the outputs. So there are several types of businesses. In this case, we're going to talk about three. A service business provides services rather than products to customers. A retail business sells products they purchase from other businesses, such as Target, Home Depot, um, a lot of companies, Walmart, Cub. Manufacturing businesses are basically those that create the products. So manufacturing businesses change various inputs into products that ultimately get sold to customers. So auto manufacturers, Apple computer, Apple products, um, 3M, automakers, many manufacturing. So in a nutshell, these are the three basic types of businesses. So to start, we're going to talk about this. Um, we're going to have some of these questions throughout and plus I'm going to put up some various exercises and then you'll also see some homework problems. So make sure you review these videos because it will help you in your homework. Which of the following businesses would be considered a service business? Well, we know Walmart um, is a merchandising because they purchase products to resell. Southwest is an airline that provides a service of flying. Ford Motor is a manufacturing and Starbucks provides I'm sure all of you love their various products. So Southwest would be a service business. Walmart and Starbucks would be considered retail and Ford would be manufacturing. So for business activities with companies, we segregate them into three types of activities. Any activity that a company provides is going to fall into either financing activities, investing activities, or operating activities. Now I'm going to tell you right now that most of these activities for businesses are going to be operating. The reason the company's in business. So operating activities would be buying products, selling products, and then all the expenses or costs associated with the company being in business. However, financing activities are significant. Financing activities relate to those transactions or activities the company has with investors and creditors. Well, investors would be um, stockholders or creditors may be banks loans, you know, how they receive money in order to grow or come into business apart from that money that the initial owner provided. Investing activities involve only the purchase and the sale of long-term assets. Now it says the purchase and sale of resources that benefit for several years, which would be long-term assets. So every transaction a business is engaged in will fall under one of these activities, financing, investing, and operating. And no, that most day-to-day -day activities of a company would be under operating. Financing is borrowing or 
receiving income from um, angel investors or stockholders and investing are, is the purchase and sell of long-term assets. So financing um, would be issuing stock, or borrowing money, investing, the purchase and sell of long-term assets. Those assets that are gonna last for over one year. And then operating activities are the day-to-day -day activities involved with running a business. So when you think of a business, all businesses, in order to engage in operations, need employees, they need insurance, they need rent or utilities, um, products, labor. Those are the day-to-day -day activities. So how does accounting play out with all this? Well, the role of accounting in a business is to provide information for managers to use to operate the business. So I say sometimes accounting is analyzing transactions. So it's about um, analyzing the transactions and then communicating this information in the form of financial statements. Accounting provides information to other users in assessing the economic performance and condition of a business. So accounting basically measures various transactions and then puts them in a form of financial statements in order to communicate information to users. Now, accounting has, uh, there's several types of accounting, be it um, for internal purposes or external purposes. But basically, either way, accounting is an information system that provides reports to users about the economic activities and the condition of a business. I like to say accounting measures activities of a business and then communicates them, communicates that those activities in the form of financial statements. So here you see there are various business activities and we learn how to measure these activities. So there are activities that may be related to the resources of a company, which we call assets. There may be activities related to amounts that a company or business may owe debt. We call those liabilities. There may be activities related to monies that the owners or the stockholders put in to a company, which we call stockholders equity. Sometimes we have activities related to paying dividends or, or providing those stockholders with a benefit because since they've put money into the company, they want something from their investment, which we call dividends. Those are distributions to the owners. Sometimes we have activities related to selling, sales or selling products and services. We call those revenues. And then we have costs because to make or to provide those revenues, there's costs associated with providing those revenues. And we call those expenses. So we're going to go into a lot of detail. But what I want you guys to do is to try to keep things simple. So if we just, if you just listen to me and we just go through the process, very straightforward, it's going to make sense to you guys. So accounting, is an information system. We are going to provide information that can be used by internal users 
managers and employees, which more links to what we call managerial accounting. But in this course, we are going to provide information and relay it to the users outside of the company, which we call investors, creditors, customers, the government. Now, boy, this is a hot topic because it's important for accountants to behave ethically, and we have seen nothing of the sort in the past couple decades. But accountants need to behave in an ethical manner, so the information they provide the users is true, it's good, it's reliable. And therefore, those individuals who are taking this information and making decisions from this information, they have accurate information in order for them to make decisions. Ethics, and if you have taken a business class, you're gonna hear ethics in every class, business class you take, but boy, oh boy, in accounting, you're gonna hear a lot about it. But ethics, we call our moral guidelines, our moral principles that help direct us in the conduct of individuals. Business managers and accountants don't always behave ethically. They behave unethically. And boy, oh boy, guys, I mean, it doesn't go far. You can look at it even in the state of Minnesota with uh, Denny Hecker. Well, that might have been 15, 20 years ago. But unethical behavior is going on all the time. That's not the norm. That's not what we want to see. We want to be above reproach. Ethical managers and accountants are honest and fair. But the problem is people get squeezed. There's pressure. There's pressure to meet certain goals or expectations. And oftentimes, managers and accountants can face those pressures to meet expectations. And sometimes as a result of those two colliding, trying to do the right thing, yet trying to please whoever to make the numbers look good, people's ethics can get compromised. So there can be greed and ethical indifferences. And basically, the most important piece in keeping companies on an ethical or a good platform is what we sometimes call the tone at the top. When the senior head or those who run the company keep a mindset of um, doing the right thing, then that sometimes can just um, um, in, uh, infiltrate or, or just spread throughout the whole company. The tone at the top is huge. If there's a company where there's the top is about numbers, making numbers, screw people and make it happen, then um, sometimes that compass, that, that attitude then breeds in the rest of the, the company. So it really is important if you're looking for a job to be aware of finding companies that they have a culture of high ethics and that they want to do the right thing. Now, here is just a list of various companies and what kind of poor decisions were made, fraud, and then what happened as a result of bad behavior. I mean, guys, there are so many. And, but here are some recent ones. Countrywide, which we don't even know of Countrywide anymore, no, nor do we know of Enron. Goldman Sachs, Sachs, I don't know if they're even around anymore. Wells Fargo's in our backyard, but boy, oh boy. 
Um, they're so big, but they actually, they keep opening customer accounts without their permission. And I just had a client just this past week. He went and, um, told me how he opened one account and they opened three. So even though they say it's not happening anymore, this guy, and obviously it happened to him in the past couple of years. Um, Xerox recognized $3 billion in sales prior to when it should have been recorded. So it's just showing the unethical behavior of companies. And fortunately, in these scenarios, you're seeing some consequences from bad behavior. I mean, Enron's just a nightmare story, and I might post... Um, Oh, the smartest guys in the room, I think, is the the video that's out on Amazon about the downfall of Enron, which was a huge oil and gas company in Houston back in the, I think it was the 80s, 90s maybe. But anyway, um, they're everywhere. So um, in accounting, no, there's a lot of of job opportunities. Actually, the field of accounting has got decreased about seven to eight percent in the past several years. People aren't going into accounting as they used to, and as a result, uh, I think these salary figures are really low because um, supply and demand, you know, as people are, there's less people in order to fill positions in a lot of um, aspects of our society, but especially accounting. So supply and demand, those fees, or the, the, the need is greater. Therefore, the salaries are greater. CPAs, um, annual starting salary at 50,000, I'd say that's really low. I would believe that that's more like 70,000 for CPAs, 70 to 80,000. Now, as we talk about generally accepted accounting principles, we call that GAAP. Financial information in the United States is based on generally accepted accounting principles, which are basically standards and guidelines that define how we go about recording various transactions. And in the United States, all companies must adhere to generally accepted accounting principles. Accounting standards are the rules that determine the accounting for business transactions. And these principles and assumptions are the framework which we construct those standards. Know that in the US we have FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which basically is responsible for creating and uh, controlling the standards that are put forth in the United States. So with financial accounting, we've got various external users, investors and creditors that need information about companies. And what's important is this information that they gather is from accountants. So these investors and creditors make information on companies based on financial information. And the, this financial information is focused and require, um, it, it's it's based on generally accepted accounting principles. One thing we have in the United States is all companies must adhere to various guidelines. And these generally accepted accounting principles are the norm in the United States. So FASB controls the United States and those public companies that are on stock exchanges are governed by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Globally, we've got another deal going on 
we've got International Accounting Standards Board. So they're trying to merge them. I don't know if it'll ever happen, but for purposes of the United States, we have the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which guides our principles. So here's one of the first exercises. And I want you to look at these and think, is it a service business? Is it a retail or is it a manufacturing business? You might not know all of them, but just take a moment and look at them and then we'll kind of go through them all. I'm going to give you a couple minutes. So Alcoa is a manufacturing. Boeing, we've heard a lot about them in the news recently. They've had their hands slapped. Airplane manufacturer, manufacturing. Caterpillar, big with farm and, uh, the farming community. Citigroup, banking, financial investment, CVS, pharmacy, Dollar General, Retail, ExxonMobil, manufacturing of gas, oil, FedEx is a service, Ford Motor, manufacturing, Gap, retail, H&R Block is a service, Hilton, service, Procter & Gamble, manufacturing, Southwest, airline, service, and Walmart is retail. So I hope that makes sense to you guys how various companies, they're going to fall into primarily either a service industry, a retail industry, or a manufacturing company. Now, when we talk about this generally accepted accounting principles that we call GAAP, know that there are as you see here, accounting standards codification that have all of the accounting standards in them, which make up our generally accepted accounting standards, or generally accepted accounting principles. The Securities and Exchange Commission really oversees those public aid companies, an agency of the U.S. government has authority over the accounting and financial disclosures for companies whose shares of ownership are traded and sold to the public. Now, if you think about it, they're held to a higher standard because the public at large can buy and, and sell those, piece, those stock. Therefore, they need to be scrutinized at a higher level. And then the IASB, International Accounting Standards Board are those companies that are outside of the U United States. They adhere to a different standard. Know that for us, the gap helps guide us into how we report transactions. The Financial Accounting Standards Board develops our principles and they work with the Securities and Exchange Commission to help support generally accepted accounting principles with public companies that are traded on stock exchanges. When we talk about GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, we have these assumptions, assume, you know, sometimes you say assumptions, assuming makes an ass out of you and me. Well, guess what? Sometimes these assumptions need to happen and we spell out what assumptions are there in generally accepted accounting principles. Well, we've got four that are not making an ass out of you and me. They are essential in these guidelines in place. And we're going to look at them in detail. The assumptions that each business is its own economic entity. 
that the monetary unit in the United States is the dollar, that periodicity means we operate in a period, uh, in a cycle, in a in like a calendar year or in some type of economic um, time frame, and that we anticipate that this business is going to go on indefinitely, a going concern. It's not going to, we're not in our minds thinking it's going to quit next year. We believe this entity is planning to go on for a, uh, forever. Now, as far as financial statements, they need to be relevant, which means they need to make sense. They need to apply, be applicable in the current day, and they need to be truthful. So relevancy means they need to have information that is beneficial for the end user to help make decisions. Being faithfully represented means the information accurately reflects the true economic activities of a company. And when we have relevant information along with faithful representation, we need our financial information to be able to be comparable which means we have to be consistently reporting it between one company within the years and also with other companies. So we follow the same guidelines. It needs to be verifiable. So you understand what is being, what it is representing. It needs to happen in a timely manner because old information is no good. No, it's not useful. So we need timeliness in financial reporting so it can be applicable for those external users to make decisions. And it needs to be understandable. So basically, they, the end user needs to understand what is comprised in these financial statements. So know that I think I wrote, I talked about all these. The time period assumption allows a business to report its economic activities on a regular basis over a specific period of time. Okay. So as far as businesses go, a proprietorship is the largest type of business that is handled in the United States. Now, that doesn't mean that's the most amount of um, where the money comes from, but there are more proprietorships in the United States than anything else. 70% of businesses entities in the United States operate as a proprietorship. It's easy to organize. You just say, I'm going to start a business and there you go. They, it's easy to quit and it's the resources of an individual and it works. Partnerships, 10% of businesses in the U.S. are partnerships. And the beauty of that is it's not just one person's finances and skills. You've got two or more. Um, resources and skills to come together. Now, a corporation, only 20% of businesses in the United States operate as a corporation. However, corporations generate 90% of the revenues in the, company, the country. So even though it's only 20% of businesses, it really... 90% of business revenues come from corporations. The beauty of a corporation is the shares or the owners of the company are not those who run the company. Usually, not always. I mean, but for the most part, the large companies 
the ownership is handled in that you have shares of a company. And while the small corporations, those individuals who own the shares run the company, with large businesses, that's not the case. The owners of a company aren't necessarily those who run a company. Now we know that limited liability companies have really become a big, um, they've taken the place of partnerships um, because it's kind of in many ways a benefit on a couple sides in that they ha have a, a separate they're a separate entity, so they have limited liability, but they're easy to form. 10% of business organizations in the U.S. <clears throat> operate as a limited liability company. So, we've got some principles we need to look at. <coughs> we've got the measurement principle, historical cost, Revenue recognition and expense recognition. So basically the measurement principle is one that says how much is it? What's the amount of an item we're going to report? Okay. Now, when we're dealing with a measurement principle, what is the basis of knowing what's appropriate or what's the correct amount is when we're dealing with two independent parties. So in other words, if it's myself and my daughter or myself and my husband, or it, there's a little more involved with being just an arm's length transaction. An arm's length transaction is such that you're shaking on something. So the key here is not what's gonna happen amongst family, but what would two independent parties provide amounts that look to be objective and verifiable? So when we look at how much we measure transactions by, we're looking at it in the form of what we call an arm's length transaction between two individuals that aren't related and what's fair. What would a normal transaction entail between two people? <coughs> Recording an item at its initial transaction price is called its historical cost principle, historical cost principle, or just cost principle. So basically what that means is when an asset is purchased, and if it was purchased in 2000 for $20,000, today you might still own that, but the historical cost principle means you record transactions at what you paid for them. Not at what they're worth, what you paid for them. Another principle, revenue is the amount earned from providing services or selling goods to customers. The revenue recognition principle says that when revenue is recorded in the accounting print, uh, records is when the revenue was earned. It doesn't always mean it's when you were paid for that transaction, but when the revenue actually, the transaction took place. And we'll talk about this in a minute. But I, I'll give you just an example. So when a, um, I prepare a tax return and the tax return has been completed, handed to the client, and the service has been satisfied, that revenue has been earned, even if they haven't paid me. The transaction, transaction took place, we handed it off, they accepted it. The revenue's been earned, even if I haven't received the money yet. 
Expenses are amounts used to generate revenues. And the expense recognition principle, what we call the matching principle, shows that expenses need to be recorded in the same period as the revenues they helped to create or that the, that they helped to make those costs associated with making those revenues. <coughs> Here we've got exercise one, three Ozark sports sells hunting and fishing equipment and provides guided hunting and fishing trips. Ozarks owned and operated by Eric Griffith, a well-known sports enthusiast and his wife. Um, she uh, owns and operates Lake Boutique, a woman's clothing store. Eric and Linda have established a savings account in the name of their children at Missouri State Bank. So for each of the following transactions, identify which of the entities listed should record the transactions in its record. So what this is trying to show you is if a business creates an event or an activity, that business should be recording that transaction, not some other business. So when Linda buys lunch for her weekly book club reading, does that have anything to do with her business or the bank that her, ch the children's name or her husband's business? No, that's a personal expense. Linda purchased two dozen spring dresses from a St. Louis designer for a special spring sale. Well, that activity, that exchange, that economic event was related to the Lake Boutique. Here we have Eric paid a breeder's fee for an English Springer Spaniel to be used as a hunting guide dog. Well, he would use that as a result of the Ozark sports. He looks like he's a sports enthusiast and hunter, and he probably um, provides uh, guide services for hunters. What's about this next one? Linda deposited a 2000 personal check in her children's accounts. That would be involved with the bank, state bank. Now that's not a business per se, but that event, that economic activity was related to her children's savings accounts. <laughs> Eric paid a local doctor for his annual physical, which is required. Um, for the workman's comp insurance policy at Ozark Sports, well, that would definitely be for Ozark Sports. Since it's required, then he gets to write that off as a business expense, as a cost. Eric received a cash advance from customers for a guided hunting trip. Well, that would be related to the business of Ozark Sports. Linda pays her dues to the YWCA. That's a personal expense, isn't it? Has nothing to do with any of the businesses. Linda donated several dresses from her inventory to a local auction. That would be an expense. The cost of those dresses would be involved with her business of the boutique. Um, Eric paid for dinner and a movie to celebrate their 12th wedding anniversary. I feel like I wrote that wrong. 12th. I think I have an F in there. It shouldn't be in there. Um, that's a personal expense. And then the advertising in a honey magazine, that would definitely be for his business in Ozark Sports. So I hope this is helpful for you to see that transactions related to a business get reported to only that business. Personal ex expenditures aren't part of the business activities and they are separate. So each entity stands on its own. What is a business transaction? Well, basically it's an economic event or condition that will change the financial condition of a company. 
So when you think of a company, and this is really key, really important, think of with a company, there are assets. We call assets resources. Assets will always equal liabilities plus owner's equity or stockholder's equity. What that means are resources will always equal either the creditor's claims to those resources, who we owe, or what we own, the owner's claims to those resources. This is called the accounting equation. It is so critical. If there's one thing you learn this week, no. Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity. Liabilities are shown before owner's equity in the accounting equation because creditors have first rights to the assets. Creditors need to be paid off. Banks, whoever has a stake in those assets, liabil loans before the owner gets what's left over. Know that assets are resources and liabilities plus stockholders equity are claims to those resources. Okay. And you could switch it around and say assets minus liabilities equals stockholders equity. So guys, what do you think? Give an example of what a company would have as an asset and a liability. Then consider what an individual would have as an asset and a liability. How would an asset differ from a business compared to an individual? How maybe could a liability differ from a business compared to an individual? Can an individual calculate their net worth using the same accounting equation? Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity. If you have questions about that, feel free to put a question on the discussion board this week. Here's another exercise. The total assets and total liabilities in millions of the Kroger company and the Procter and Gamble company are shown. So if remember that accounting equation, assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity. Our job, if we have the assets here, we have the liabilities, our job is to figure out the stockholders equity of a company. So if if you think about it, if assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity, well, wouldn't it make sense that assets minus liabilities would equal stockholders equity? So if assets for Kroger are 48,662,000, or is it 48,662,000,000, and liabilities are 39, wouldn't it make sense that the Stockholders' equity sitting at nine, comma five five zero. I'm just gonna act, do it in thousands. Nine thousand five fifty. And Procter and Gamble, if their assets are one hundred nineteen three hundred seven, and the liabilities are seventy two six fifty three, wouldn't the stockholders' equity be the difference? Forty six six fifty four. Now, using the same concept, assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. You should be able to go in here and figure out each one of these, right? <coughs> so in A, assets are going to equal the liabilities of 1.2 million and owner's equity of 875. So wouldn't assets be the total of that? 
2,075,000. And then in B, if the assets are 3,860, here we need to figure out what liabilities are, but won't that be the difference between the assets minus the owner's equity, which would be 2,960? And then in C, we have assets and we have liabilities. So we would subtract the two, subtract the assets from liabilities, minus liabilities to get our owner's equity. I hope this is making sense to you guys. What I want to do is just make it really straightforward. It really isn't complicated if we take one step at a time. Okay, now, business transactions are basically economic events that directly change an entity's financial condition and its results of operation. That's what we call a business transaction. Somehow, the accounting equation will be changed as a result of an economic event. So let's take one. <coughs> Here, on November 1st, 2023, Chris Clark deposited 25000 in a bank account in the name of Net Solutions. If you think about this, a lot of times I like to go, okay, what happened? So cash went up. This transaction increases cash Cash is an asset because it's a resource on what we call the left side of the equ equation. Remember that um, accounting equation, assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity. Assets is on the left side. It's always going to equal. Assets went up 25000 And since Chris Clark deposited 25000 in the bank account. On the right-hand side of the equation, owner's equity increased in the same amount. So the equity of the owner gets identified using the owner's name and capital. In this case, Chris Clark Capital. So basically, this transaction was an economic event because a deposit from the owner of the company, 25000 was put into the business's bank account. It increased their assets, cash, which is a resource, an asset, and it also increased the owner's claims to those assets under owner's equity of 25000 Next, <laughs> the purchase of the land uh, here, November 5th, Net Solutions paid $20,000 for the purchase of land as a future building site. Well, think about it. What went up, what went down? That's sometimes how I do it in my head is go, okay, what happened here? They bought land. So what they use to buy land? They needed cash, so cash went down, but land went up. Land increased, cash decreased. Land is a resource, it's an asset. Cash is a resource, it's an asset. Land went up, cash went down. So this didn't affect both sides of the equation per se. This affected just the assets. One asset went up. One asset went down, but we still balance, don't we? Our assets still equal our liability plus our owner's equity. So now we have only 5000 in cash, but we have 20000 in land. So our assets are still at $25,000. they are no longer just cash. They've, they've been changed, but they're still assets. Next, on November 10th, Net Solutions purchased supplies 
for $1,350 and agreed to pay the supplier in the future. Okay, what does this mean? What this means here is they purchased some supplies, but they owe the money. They didn't pay the money right away when they got the supplies. They owe somebody the money. Owing money is called a liability. This liability was created because we purchased something which we call on account, meaning we haven't paid it yet. We owe them the money. <clears throat> These can be items that, like these um, supplies, we purchased them. We have them now, but we owe somebody. <clears throat> so in this case, our supplies of thirteen fifty is a prepaid expense, which we call an asset. The, these supplies have a future use. We didn't use them all up. They, we have $1,350 of goods or supplies that we get to use. So it's an asset. But since we didn't pay for it yet, we have a creditor's claim. We have a liability. We owe that money. Another way we call it is a future sacrifice. So we got the benefit of the supplies, but we owe $1,350 to the vendor. So we owe this money, which means we have to sacrifice something in the future which is what we call a liability. But do you see now our assets of 26,350 equal our liabilities of 1350 plus our owner's equity of 25,000. Do we balance? We still balance. Now, Net Solutions received cash of 7500 for providing services to customers. So in this case, we received cash, which was awesome because we earned some money from providing services. What happens here is that cash is a resource or an asset. So that increased, but that owner's equity, or excuse me, those fees we earned of 7,500 is part of revenue. And that revenue gets put into the owner's equity section because revenues increase our owner's equity and expenses decrease our owner's equity. <coughs> so in this case, by providing services, and receiving the cash, the cash went up 7,500 and our revenues, what we call fees earned, also went up 7,500. So our assets still equal our liabilities plus our stockholders equity. No, revenues are providing services. And when we have revenues, from selling merchandise, we call it sales. But when we have revenues from providing services, we call it fees earned. Okay. You can have other types of revenue, rent revenue, interest revenue, um, you name it revenue, but we have all kinds of revenue. Now, in this case, we received the cash when we provided the service. But if we didn't receive cash when we provided the service, then companies have provided the service, but they may accept cash at a later date. And if that's the case, then in instead of showing cash increased, we would show an asset called accounts receivable, money 
that is on account that we know we're going to be receiving. Account receivable, sales on account, that is an asset that if we didn't receive the cash, we would show an asset called accounts receivable. We know we're going to receive that money. Now, <coughs> the net solutions paid the following expenses during the month. Wages of $21.25, rent of $800, utilities of $450, and miscellaneous of $275. So if you think about it, in order for a business to earn money, it costs. They have to utilize, um, they have to come up with costs in order to make profit, make revenues. Profit's the net between the revenues minus the expenses. So these are costs in order to make revenues, okay? Assets used in this process of earning revenues are called expenses. And expenses include supplies used, payments for employee wages, utilities, and others. These are called expenses. The effect of expenses is the opposite of revenues. Revenues increase owner's equity, but expenses decrease owner's equity. So in this case, if you look at the wage expense, the rent expense, the utilities expense, and the miscellaneous expense, those all decrease our owner's equity. So we reduced our cash by $36.50, and we reduced our owner's equity in the form of all these expenses. But do our assets still equal our liabilities plus our stockholders' equity? They do. Now Net Solution paid creditors on account 950. So we owed money for some supplies. And we paid 950 of it. So do you see our cash decreased? So cash is a resource, it decreased. But we also decreased our liability, that accounts payable, that amount we owed. So after this transaction, our assets of 29250 still equal our liabilities plus our stockholders' equity. The beauty of accounting is everything balances after every transaction. If it doesn't balance, something's wrong. Now, Chris Clark determined that the cost of supplies on hand at the end of the period, sorry guys, was $550. So what that means is he purchased supplies of $1,350. But, only 550 of those supplies are left, which means he used up $800 of those supplies, pens and paper and, and ink and whatever. So we need to show what's really left is 550. So he used up as a supplies expense, $800. So what we have to do is, in the assets, we have to show $800 of resources were used up. And then we have to show over in supplies expense under those owner's equity, 800 cost was utilized. But do you see guys how our assets still equal? Our liabilities plus owner's equity. <coughs> now, Chris Clark withdrew $2,000 from the business for personal use. So he basically took this like as a dividend. This is the opposite of an investment. This is more a withdrawal, which we call owner's name and drawing. It's a, it would be a dividend if it's in a stockholder's scenario, but we're, in this case, we're looking at him as a proprietor. So withdrawals get recorded as a sub subtraction under Chris Clark Capital. 
So you see, we show under Chris Clark Capital when he contributed 25,000, that was a plus. Now that he's taking a piece of the profits, we show a subtraction of 2,000 in cash, and we're gonna show Chris Clark drawing of $2,000, a subtraction here. But do our assets still equal our liabilities plus our stockholders' equity? They do. So after all of these transactions, we went through a bunch of transactions and we measured them. The way we measured them, by we looked at them and we said, okay, what happened here? What went up? What went down? And we looked at each one and we showed, was it an asset? Was it a liability or was it under the owner's equity section? And after each one, we still balance our assets still equal our liabilities plus our owner's equity. No, owner's equity is a little more involved now. It only, it includes not only owner's investments that gets added, and we subtract any owner's drawings or withdrawals. We also show an increase in revenues that come in, and we subtract out the expenses. <coughs> so no, Revenues and expenses are part of what we call an income statement. Revenues increase the owner's equity. Expenses decrease the owner's equity section. How about this one, guys? Charles Lambert buys an adjoining piece of land to expand his public golf course. He pays 89000 in cash to acquire this land. Based on the accounting equation, what would be the effect of this transaction? So, I don't mean to sound weird here, but think about it. He can't buy it with his looks. He's got to use something that matters. So, cash, tangible cash. What happens to cash when he spends 89,000 on land? It goes down. But what has gone up? Or what else has happened? He now has land. So one account called land, which is a resource, increases. And then one resource called cash decreases. So cash decreases by 89,000 and land increases by 89,000. That makes sense? Both are assets. So looking at this accounting equation uh, exercise, Okay, I'm just trying to get this to move and I can't, oh, there we go. So this accounting equation, exercise 1-7, captivating your audience is a motivational consulting business owned and operated by Edith Kittrell. At the end of its accounting period, May 31st, 2022, Captivating has assets of two million four hundred fifty and liabilities of one million one hundred eighty thousand. Using the accounting equation and considering each case independently, determine the following amounts. So if the assets are two million four hundred fifty and the liabilities are one million one hundred eighty, what would owner's equity be? Well, wouldn't owner's equity be the difference? Assets minus liabilities equals owner's equity. Wouldn't that be 1270 Then B says owner's equity on May 31st, assuming that of 2000Y3, 2023, 
assuming that assets have increased by 825,000 and liabilities have increased by 515,000. So if we added 825,000 to the assets of already 2,450 and liabilities of 1,180 plus the 515, then wouldn't our new owner's equity be 1,580,000? Because remember, assets always equal liabilities plus owner's equity. C says owner's equity as of May 31st, 2023, assuming that assets decreased by 375 and liabilities increased by 60,000. Then in that scenario, if assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity, then in this case, our stockholders or owner's equity would be $835,000. D, owner's equity as of 20, May 2023, assuming that assets increased by 725, 725,000 and liabilities decreased by 120,000, then our owner's equity is going to be 2 million. 115,000. The key here, guys, is assets will always equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. Net income during 2023, assuming that as of May 31st, 2023, assets were 3,300,000. Liabilities were 1400000 and the owner made no additional investment in the business or withdrew any cash for personal use. So wouldn't that make sense that revenues minus expenses equal net income? So in this case, if the assets were at 3,300 and the liabilities were at 1,400. The net income, if nothing else happened on the owner's equity side of him putting money in or taking money out, means the net income had to have been 630,000. <clears> if nothing else happened on the owner's equity side. So, Here's another uh, exercise. What is the effect of each of the following transactions on the three elements? Remember, assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. If the owner invested additional cash in the business, what's going to happen there? Won't assets increase because of the cash going up? And won't owner's equity increase because he's increasing his equity in the company? If he paid for business expenses, you use cash to pay for them. So cash decreases, which is an asset. And owner's equity decreases because expenses decrease owner's equity. If the owner withdrew cash for personal use, Cash goes down, which is an asset, and a drawing, owner's equity goes down because he took money out. Now, here's an interesting one. Think about this. Purchase supplies on account. Supplies is an asset. It goes up. But he didn't use cash to pay for him. He owes the money, so it creates a liability. So assets increase and liabilities increase. Then if he receives cash for services performed, cash, which is an asset increases and owner's equity revenue also increases. 
<coughs> now we've got a couple more. A vacant lot acquired for 115500 is sold for 298000 in cash. What is the effect of the sale on the total amount of the seller's assets, liabilities, and stockholders' equity? So think about it. If the asset was on the books at one fifteen five, and yet it sold for two ninety eight in cash, wouldn't it make sense? There's one hundred eighty three thousand increase in an asset. So the the land or the lot land was subtracted one fifteen five went away because we no longer own that land. So that asset was reduced, but 298,000 of cash was added. So the difference between the land that was reduced and the cash that was added of 298 is that assets increased 183,000. An owner's equity also increased in 183000 because there wasn't any debt on that. Make sense? Next. Assume the seller owes 80000 on a loan for the land. After receiving the 298000 cash, the seller pays the 80000 owed. Sorry, I missed the three zeros there. Just put those in real quick. This is a new book, so it's all new PowerPoints, and I'm sorry for the mess up. What is the effect of the payment on the total amount of the seller's assets, liabilities, and owner's equity? So if you think about this, the Seller received 298000 in cash, but they needed to pay down 80000 on the loan. Okay? So, assets decreased by 80000 Liabilities decreased by 80000 And no change in owner's equity because they needed cash of 80 to pay down the loan of 80. So assets went down 80, the liability is gone. Assets went down 80, liability went down 80. Is it true that a transaction always affects at least two elements? No. Some transactions only affect one element of the accounting equation. Remember, if you purchase land for cash, land is an asset that goes up, cash goes down. So it's only affecting assets. See what I'm saying? It's not necessarily affecting liabilities plus stockholders' equity. So it's only affecting the asset section of the accounting equation. So there are transactions that don't always affect two elements, with an element being assets, an element being liabilities, or an element being owner's equity. There are often times, like in the scenario of um, purchasing land, where one asset goes up, another asset goes down. So in this exercise, it asks, indicate whether each of the following types of transactions will increase owner's equity or would decrease owner's equity. So here, received cash from the owner as an additional investment in the business. Well, think about it. When you think of the accounting equation, more cash means an increase in assets and then something has to happen on the other side of the equation, which owner's equity would also increase. 
receive cash for services performed for customers, cash increases, owner's equity in the form of revenue increases, paid for business expenses, when the asset cash decreases, the owner's equity will decrease. Paid cash to the owner for personal use, cash decreases, owner's equity decreases. This exercise shows the following selected transactions were completed by Coded Delivery Services during July. Indicate the effect of each transaction on the accounting equation by listing the numbers identifying the transactions 1 through 10 in a column and inserting at the right of each number the appropriate letter from the following list. Increases in asset, decrease in another asset, or is there an increase in an asset and increase in a liability? Is there an increase in an asset and increase in owner's equity? Is there a decrease in an asset and a decrease in a liability? Or a decrease in an asset and a decrease in owner's equity? So number one, received cash from the owner as an additional investment in the business of 50000 so think about it. When you receive cash, cash is an asset, which is a resource, and it increases. Then it tells us this was an additional investment in the business. Wouldn't that be an increase in owner's equity? So asset increases, owner's equity increases. C. Number two. Purchases supplies for cash. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be supplies as an asset that increases, but cash to purchase them for cash, that cash decreases. Both are assets. So there's an increase in one asset, supplies, a decrease in the other asset, cash, which is um, an asset. Okay. Next, paid rent for July forty five hundred. If you think of that, the um, paying rent, you're using cash to pay rent, so that is a decrease in an asset and it's a decrease in owner's equity. So that would be E. Paid advertising expenses just like the one before. It's a decrease in an, ass, in an asset because you're using cash. It's a decrease in owner's equity because of the expense. Receive cash from providing delivery services. You're increasing the asset cash and you're increasing owner's equity because you're receiving revenues. So that would be C. Build customers for delivery services on account. So you're increasing owner's equity and you're increasing an asset called accounts receivable. You don't have the cash yet, but we have owner's um, accounts receivable, which is an asset. That's C. Seven, we pay creditors on account. When we pay creditors, we're reducing our cash, we're using cash, so it decreases our asset, and this decreases our liability, which is D. When we receive cash from customers on account, this is a scenario where we had an accounts receivable. We're waiting to get paid from someone, and they did pay us. So one asset, cash goes up, one asset, accounts receivable goes down. So that's A. We determined that the cost of supplies on hand was $300 and $1,500 of had supplies had been used during the month. So supplies is an asset. 
when we realize we've used up some supplies, the asset supplies goes down and the owner's equity goes down because that's an expense. Then we paid cash to the owner for personal use. That would also be E. Our cash goes down for a thousand and our owner's equity goes down as a drawing for a thousand. Here, Terry West owns and operates her own catering service. Summary financial data for July are presented in equation form. Each line designated by a number indicates the effect of a transaction on the equation. Each increase and decrease in the owner's equity, except transaction five, affects income. Now, in this case, number one, what happened here? Provided catering services for cash. Do you see our cash went up 71.8 and our fees earned went up 71.8. Number two, we purchased land for cash. Our Cash went down 15,000, but our land went up 15,000. In number three, we paid cash for expenses of 47,500. You see our cash went down and our expenses increased, but it reduced our owner's equity by 47,500. Next, we purchased assets on account. Our assets went up and our liabilities went up the same amount, which means we didn't use cash to pay for it. We owe the money. Then we paid cash to the owner for drawing for personal use. Our cash went down and our owner's equity went down. Here we paid cash to creditors of 4,000. We used 4,000 in cash and we reduced our liabilities by 4,000. Here, we realized that our supplies, 1,500 were used up during the, the period. So our supplies went down and our owner's equity went down because it's now an expense. So do you see through all these transactions, our assets will still always equal our liabilities plus our owner's equity. Okay. What is the amount of the net increase in cash during the month? Do you see how it started at 40,000 and it ended at 40,300? So our increase during the month is $300 in cash. What is the amount of net increase in owner's equity during the month? Do you see we started with 117.5 and we ended with fees of earned of 71.8 minus the 49,000 and the 5,000 minus 54,000. So 71.8 minus 54,000 would be 17,000. 800 is what the owner's equity increased. What is the amount of net income for the month? Well, the fees earned minus the expenses, the 71.8 minus the 49,000. Revenues minus expenses is our profit, our net income of 22.8. How much of the net income was retained in the business? The 228 minus the 5,000 of drawings shows 178 was kept in the business. Now, we're trying to understand the process of the accounting equation. And we're looking at various transactions that we're analyzing. We're trying to measure them and figure out where do they go? How do we account for what? bucket we put them in and how much we put them in. Now, after transactions have been recorded and summarized, then we prepare reports. These reports that we communicate to the users are called 
financial statements. And the main financial statements are the income statement, the statement of owner's equity, the balance sheet, and the statement of cash flows. No, we first prepare the income statement. It's revenues minus expenses equal our net income. Next, we prepare the statement of owner's equity. It just shows what's transpired over a sp uh, per specific period of time. So what was the balance before we started? How much did the owner invest in the business? How much did the owner take out as drawings in the business? And then what was the net income? You see, we have to start with the net income financial statement because we need that net income amount in order to put it into the statement of owner's equity. Then the balance sheet is exactly like the accounting equation. Assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. We need the statement of owner's equity so we know what the owner's equity is for the balance sheet then the statement of cash flow really just shows how we used our cash what cash came in and what cash went out remember guys I love this picture a balance sheet is just a snapshot in time it's just a moment a moment I like to equate it as this you get your paycheck and your bank sitting with ten thousand dollars in it then the next three hours or the next day it's back down to a thousand dollars because you paid all your bills do you understand what i'm saying with a snapshot one transaction changes it instantly so the deposit goes in it looks great but then once you pay your bills it's a different story so it's just a snapshot it's a moment in time here you see the income statement for net solutions showing the revenues and the expenses one thing i want you to be really aware of you know it's an expense because it has the word expense after it don't put a liability as an expense the word the an expense will always have the word expense then you need that net income in order to complete the stock, statement of stockholders' equity. Then you need the statement of stockholders' equity in order to complete the balance sheet. Then the statement of cash flows, you need the balance of cash in your balance sheet to tie with what your statement of cash flows should show as cash at the end of the period. So this is really important, guys, that you understand there is a specific sequence to completing the financial statements. Okay, uh, what happened here? I don't know what I did different there. Um, income statement shows revenues and expenses if you have more revenues than expenses we call that net income or net profit but if you have more expenses than revenues it's not a good picture that would be a net loss the statement of owner's equity reports the changes in owner's equity over a period of time it's prepared after the income statement because the net income or net loss for the period is reported on the statement of owner's equity. But it's prepared before the balance sheet because the amount of owner's equity at the end of the period gets put on the balance sheet. Okay? The balance sheet reports the assets, the liabilities, and the owner's equity in a vertical format at a certain point in time. Think of a snapshot. This form of a balance sheet is called the report form. 
assets always come first and the accounts in the asset section normally are listed in order of liquidity which means cash is as cash as liquid as you can get accounts receivable you'll be getting the money in from customers so that's liquid and then the harder it is to convert those assets to cash they go farther down on the asset section of the balance sheet when we're dealing with liabilities when there are two or more liabilities each should be listed and the total of the liabilities are totaled the statement of cash flows remember at the start of this slide we of uh, uh, this lecture we talked about three types of business activities we talked about operating investing and financing activities basically the statement of cash flows shows how cash came in and went out based on these three activities every transaction that involves cash will be under one of these activities no there's a relationship among all of these financial statements no that the net income from the income statement flows to the statement of owner's equity. Know that the ending balance of the statement of owner's equity flows to the balance sheet. So know, as you see here, the balance of cash at the end of the period is going to match the statement of cash flows cash. The net income for the period is going to flow to the statement of owner's equity because we add the net income to the statement of owner's equity and we subtract any drawings. Then the statement of owner's equity will flow back to the balance sheet because assets equal liabilities plus stockholders or owner's equity. So guys, which financial statement would the owner want to review if they were interested in the company's sales expenses and net income or loss? Remember, the income statement is revenues minus expenses. The income statement for, for February indicates a net income of $17,500. During the same period, the owner withdrew $25,500. Would it be correct to say that the business incurred a net loss of 8000 No. The business incurred a profit of 17500 That's the net income. Just because the owner took money out doesn't affect the withdrawal. The withdrawals do not have an effect in the earnings of a company. The excess of owner withdrawals over the net income is a decrease in the amount of owner's equity in the business, but it has nothing to do with the profit. Here, we're looking at four different companies, Amber, Blue, Coral, and Daffodil. They're having a balance sheet, and at the beginning and end of the year, we have beginning of the year assets, and liabilities and end of the year assets and liabilities. On the basis of the preceding data and the following additional information for the year, determine the net income or loss of each company for the year. First, determine the amount of increase or decrease in owner's equity during the year. So here, Amber's business all of them have the same assets and liabilities, but it's telling us with Amber, there was no additional owner's investment and owner's withdrawals. So if assets were at $1,220,000 and liabilities at the beginning of the year were at $990,000, that means... Um, the net there was 230. 
At the end of the year, the assets were one million seven thirty, and liabilities were one million one fifty or five hundred eighty thousand. So the difference is the increase. And if there were no owners' investments coming in or no withdrawals being paid out, all of that would have been income of three hundred fifty thousand. Here, with Blue, no additional owner's invest investment, but the owner withdrew 60000 So in that case, if the owner withdrew 60000 part of the stockholder's equity section was um, a withdrawal of 60000 So if previously the net income would have been three fifty. But if in this scenario they withdrew sixty thousand, that means in Blue's case the net income would have been at four hundred and ten thousand. Here, Coral, the owner invested an additional one hundred forty thousand in the business and made no withdrawals. So again, part of the owner's equity then showed a hundred forty thousand of withdrawals. Therefore, three hundred fifty thousand minus the withdrawals of one hundred forty shows the net income for coral would have been two hundred ten. And then with daffodil, it shows the owner invested one hundred forty and withdrew sixty. So we would take what the owner's the net income should be. We show what was invested, what was withdrawn, and as a result. The net income in this case would have been two seventy. As we move on to exercise one sixteen, Rick Morris owns and operates Bobcat Appliance Service. From the following list, um, identify those that would be listed on the balance sheet. Now remember, assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. Okay, so on the balance sheet, we will list assets, which would be equipment, which is a resource, land is a resource, cash is a resource or an asset, and supplies is a resource. The liabilities accounts payable. We always know it's a liability because it says payable. There is one liability that we'll get to in probably week two that doesn't have the word payable, but no, most say payable. <coughs> and then we've got a oh, wages payable also. And then we've got our owner's equity. Know that our revenues and our expenses are part of the income statement. Okay. Now, Billy owns and operates organic products. Financial information related to organic products company for the month ended June 30th is as follows. So it shows the Billy's capital at the end of the period, the net income, the withdrawals, and any additional investment he made. We are going to prepare a statement of stockholders' owner's equity. So we start with the beginning balance which is the 1,810,000. We add additional investments, we add the net income, and we subtract the withdrawals to come up with the ending balance. That ending balance then is going to go on the balance sheet as of June 30th, 2029. So here we've got imaging services, was organized on March 1st, 2025, and a summary of the revenue and expense transactions for March follows. Make an income statement. Remember, an income statement are revenues minus expenses. So we show our fees earned and our expenses give us a net income here of 135000 Guys, we're covering so much in this first chapter. 
we've got the first two, three weeks are really full of information. So you just got to hang in there with me. Um, there's just so many aspects you're learning in these first couple weeks. This one says, one item is omitted in each of the following summaries of balance sheet and income statement data for the following four different proprietorships. Determine the missing amount. So here, for Freeman, think of it. We've got the, um, let me look here, the owner's equity at the end of the year is 930. Owner's equity at the beginning of the year is 540. There is an increase in owner's equity of 390. Deduct the increase due to net income. So basically, we see our net income is the 570 minus the 240. Okay? The 570 minus the 240 shows our net income of 330. So the additional investment by the owner has to be 60,000 here. Okay? Let me just make sure I'm not giving you bad advice. Uh, 930, 540, additional investment by owner, because it all has to balance beginning of the period, ending of the period, ending, beginning, the difference has to be what was added as net income, what was subtracted as with, um, withdrawals or drawing, and then what was put in as an investment. They all have to equal here. In this case with Hayward, we're looking for the revenue. So we know everything else. Owner's equity at the end of the period is 455. At the beginning is 230. So it would increase 225,000. We know he put in an additional 150,000, took out 32,000 as drawings. Okay, therefore, we know the expenses, therefore the revenue had to be, it's just a, a fill-in of 235000 Here with Ramirez, we're looking for the assets. So we know the beginning of the period, or the end of the period is 134. And we know there was a revenues minus expenses showed a loss of 13,000. We know he added 55,000 of um, investment. He took out 39,000. Therefore, if we know our liabilities, then we can plug in our assets. Jones, here we're looking for the withdrawals he had. In this case, he had withdrawals of 16,500. Here, if you look at the balance sheet and net income, here we've got Kyler G operates Ebony Interiors. We see the February and March information. Here's the balance sheet. Determine the amount of net income for March, assuming no additional investments or withdrawals were made. Okay, so in this case, the um, balance sheet, we've got the 320. The 800, this is as of February, the assets. And we've got the liability of 310, so we know what his capital had to be. His capital was 840 because we know it's got to be the 1,150 minus the 310,000. 
And in this case, excuse me, um, I just want to make sure I'm not getting myself far behind here. In February of 2023, we know it was at 840. But then it tells us for March, they know he had withdrawals of 50,000. So we have to go and show the 50,000 in withdrawals. And we, in this case, we can see the assets are at 1,375,000. We know the accounts payable is sitting at 400,000. We know for this purpose, we've got the cash, the accounts receivable, and the supplies minus the accounts payable, which show his capital account is sitting at 975. Now that, in this case, it's showing the 50,000 of this 975, 975,000, 50,000 were, was withdrawn as a drawing. So here, we had the balance sheets determine the amount of net income for March. You see the 975 minus the 840 of owner's equity would be the 135. But if we figure out the C portion, if we see that he withdrew as a drawing 50,000, in this case, the net income's gonna be 185,000. <laughs> now, with a balance sheet, we can look at various ratios. Financial statements are helpful, but oftentimes external users use various ratios to help interpret what's going on with the company. So liabilities to owner's equity is a really big ratio to see how much debt does a company have in relation to the investment from the owners. Many large companies are organized as corporations, so it's gonna be debt to stockholders equity. Here, we've got Twitter and we've got Alphabet. You see year one figures and year two figures. With Twitter, end of year one, their debt to equity was sitting at 0.46. Oopsie, sorry. And in year two, the debt to equity was sitting at 0.92. With Alphabet, it's much, much lower. So a higher ratio, a higher number here, means there's more debt to equity. So Alphabet has lower debt to equity. In the future, we'll get into what that means. So much of this is dependent on what type of company it is and how the other companies within that same sector relate. So guys, I think we have covered everything in this chapter. I hope this has been helpful for you and I will see you in the discussions.